And we're all about it, basically, if it has a chip in it and you can build an industry talking about the life around that, that's what we do. I do not have all the answers, but I, um, I am pretty good at predicting, like, two years ago, well, first of all, I look at the list of who comes to CES, and I said, oh my God, like every banker's here, why aren't we doing something for them? Visa's here, MasterCard's here, let's start digital money. And so it came out okay. Then this year I said, oh my God, so a thousand new products get introduced each month, um, each, each CES, so we started uh, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, so that these webcams, and it was really fortuitous when DIN happened last week and all the webcams uh, were hacked into, I'm going, yes because that's what we were trying, we couldn't have orchestrated it better than to have a need for a show that would educate people. So I called this talk, Thinking Outside the App. And, and I, it's not a talk, because you're gonna have to chime in, because I do not know all the answers. But I'm gonna try and frame it as, what are the things happening in the real world that should be informing you? And you just heard this real world, these kids, and you saw them. They're not playing what you built. Um, they're playing, what were you playing out there? What were you playing? Um, Smash. Smash. Did anybody show that this morning? No. <laughs> so there's, um, there's something, right. So, so at any rate, there's, and there's something um, disconnected about all this. So I'm gonna take you to a couple of trends that I see. I'm gonna start with artificial intelligence. And so the Gartner Group just said that by 2020, Algorithms will affect your lives, your behavior, of millions of people globally. Do you know what artificial intelligence is? Yeah. Mike, have you ever used? Uh, right. It's not real. Humans, but Ever hear of IBM Watson? So imagine you have a um, every book in the world, and you feed it to this computer, who eats it up and learns everything, and then can predict things based on what it learns. So if you say, you come up to IBM Watson and say, I have a sore throat, my glands hurt a little bit, I have a fever, it compares you to all the other people that it knows about from reading all these medical documents, and it says, hmm, is your tongue yellow too? And it will start to predict what you have, taking what it's, you've taught it, and learn more for the next time. It's getting really good, and all I can say is, if you want to have fun, Go, go to the Watson site, they've got a lot of free demos. Um, you can actually see how your social media, um, I'll show it to you actually in a minute, which movie star you're like. Um, you can, um, if you use finance these days, and if you're not at the $10 million uh, wealth, chances you're using a robo-advisor, um, and robo-advisors have made finance incredibly inclusive because you don't have to come in with a $10,000 minimum. You can come in with a dollar minimum to a site like Betterment or Stash Invest and ask you a bunch of questions about how you want your money invested, and you're a player in the game because it's a robot back there, not a human. And so um, there is one toy out on the market. How many of you have played with or seen Cogni, the dinosaur? So Cogni, I'm not, no judgments here. Cogni is powered by IBM Watson's um, natural language and its own engine. The best I can say at the point they're at now that if you're a child who tells it you like pizza, pizza will come up in your math problems. Um, and that's about, it's, a, it's an early stage. Um, everybody remembers Barbie. Um, I think she got a rough deal, but I think that um, you're going to see this year um, a lot of talking toys, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a second, and a lot of understanding a child or understanding who you're talking to to give them better service. The old Netflix, you like this, you might like this. And you'll see that um, in all sorts of ways that are going to ask you to give up something to get something. Anybody else have an AI, kind of want to yell out an AI experience? I just wanted to mention that uh, Watson EDU is free for the APIs if you want to tie your software into it. If uh, you're not doing something like over a thousand calls a month, it's pretty awesome. That's pretty incredible. And their cookbook 
is horrible. They have an AI cookbook, like you put things in the refrigerator and based on what other people cook, oh, yeah. it's not going to get. So it's, but like little things, the role is an app that actually uses uh, facial recognition, place reg image recognition algorithms to sort your photos on, on your um, iPad by, um, by face. Um, if you go to Cornell's site, they have a huge number of student-generated AI products that you can play with. Um, we've been looking for a humanoid, Jesse knows this, because they're doing great, a humanoid robot um, shelling AI just to cover, and there's a company in California called Hansen Robotics. Uh, Sophia is their pride and joy, but they're making robots skinned with human faces that um, are using AI behind them to talk. Microsoft also has, and, and if you just look at, and this is a really hard slide to read, but if you look at the APIs that you can extend your apps to use, um, uh, computer vision, uh, can anybody miss something? Blog speech, what else? Um, spell chat. So there are all sorts of extensible things that you can build in. So I did this free thing on does IBM Watson know me? It takes my social media and it um, compared me to John Legend, which was um, and actually broke out all the reasons why, compared me to other movie stars on, on different things. Lots of fun. And there was something to it. It was actually people who I wasn't like. Um, it kind of went on and on, and why it picked the things I had. In the old world, we had an organizing principle. You had an email address, you had a phone number, you had a website address, you had a Twitter handle. And the new world, as you know, will be organized. Data will be quite different, and it already is quite different. Your phone knows where you are, and contextually, that changes. So, you know, Ethan Allen, when you're doing your homework, and Ethan Allen, when you're at the furniture store, are two different things that a different data structure would know. And um, if anybody's talked to their phone lately, you, or looked at their Google when it comes up, you know how smart that thing is getting about offering you cards and information and extra examples of uh, whatever, from the weather to, um, to politics. It's always scary how much they know about me, and it's, they seem to know more every day, probably more than about me. So I'll leave AI just saying that um, it's really, at the end of the day, it's about personalization. It's personalization, and it's learning from both the computer's experience and the human's experience. And I think it's going to fundamentally change how we build things um, and, and a lot of other um, issues as well. Um, I'll move to augmented reality. So right now, not virtual reality, so not virtual reality when like you're in the other world, when you're actually immersed in a world, but augmented when you're taking something and adding information to it. In our beauty area, like Everybody, if you walk to Sephora now, you can actually stand your own face and try on your lipsticks. This one is, I think, UCAM or Mo Modi Face. And they're selling products. At the back end, they're selling products. You scan your face in, you love that lipstick shade just for you. The store no longer has to have inventory. They can just mix up your shade right there, like paint. And um, so that's one type of AR. If you look at, uh, there's a Lego YouTube, and I won't play it now because you're all probably going to starve to death, but hold your camera on the QR code on the box and what's in the box comes out. So you don't have to worry about sitting there and being disappointed when you get home because you're unboxing right in the store with AR. Um, uh, and so I think um, that magazines, Esquire just did one um, in AR where the the, the models wearing the fashions came out on the runway and when you put your camera on them. So that idea of um, involving you and getting extra information is huge. It gets even more huge, and this is where I'm going to, uh, David Clayman's going to be my backup guy here. When you add what you have in every mobile phone, which is proximity and um, geolocation. So now I'm standing, and you saw the beginning of it in Pokemon. Um, um, but now I'm standing somewhere and the information is in a context based on my likes and dislikes and my world is being augmented with factoids about where I'm standing and what I'm doing and you've been doing some stuff with kids looking at 
Most of I mean, we haven't been building anything. What I when I've been talking about AR lately, it's been trying to flip things for people and encourage them to think of AR as a means of, of, of for kids to become producers, and not just consumers. And the idea that, that Robin's talking about about proximity and mapping. Imagine. And, I'm going to say up front, I'm sure there are lots of privacy issues with this, but I'm sure they're solvable as well. Imagine the idea a kid scores his first school in soccer, goes home, draws a picture of it, narrates a story of it, and geotags it to the place where he got that first school. Somebody else comes along with their phone and, say, and the phone says, there's a story here. So that you start to create, I was calling it uh, narrative geocaching. Uh, so here you go. So Metaverse, a company that just got a $2 million uh, fund, really is taking Pokemon and opening it up to authorship. So you can make your own Go game in your own neighborhood with your own things. And as David says, it's narrative geotagging. You are telling a story, reading geocaching. a story. Geocaching. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the story stays there in the spot, and it's right. like a treasure other people find floating. It's very interesting. Yeah, a lot better than digging for things you bury in fields. <laughs> right. So next year we're going to do narrative geo. We were talking about who you bury in the what you bury in the But field. narrative geotagging could work too. Could work as well. I'm Absolutely. here at the Louvre, and this is my impression of it. I'm going to guide you. And, um, and there are other examples like this. There's one out of MIT, Tailblazer, um, and there's one other I'm forgetting right now. So we'll get to the privacy issues because they're really they are serious and. And as you heard the talk with Pokemon, I mean, it's not hard, too hard to imagine that every store in America would be putting out an ad for a kid to walk in based on a Pokestop. So there are um, serious concerns, but um, that's, we'll talk about that at the end. So not augmented reality, not adding things, but, but the virtual reality. And again, David, who's now building an area for virtual reality, I went through your report. Yeah. And um, asked questions and, and found some data that I hope he talks about. Um, what age can they actually distinguish what's going on, real from unreal? Um, and I have to tell you, as a reporter, the weirdest thing is to be in virtual reality with the company watching you. you know, <laughs> so they're making you do this demo and you're trying to, like, I'm painting the picture. And you know that 10 people are watching you and you feel like, Really idiotic. All, all virtual. You're in a very vulnerable place when you're under that that headset because you're responding. To, I have a video that I can show anyone tonight if they want to see of people experiencing an HTC Vive um, fairy garden that, that we built, and I've got the split screen of what they're seeing and how they're responding. And it really is just a little too intimate when you see you know the tree is falling and you watch the people jumping yeah. or screaming. Yeah, no, I, I had a dancer who was pretty much lap dancing with me. I mean, it was really, un it really was uncomfortable, yeah. and they're all just saying... Well, we've had our first virtual groping story. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, Bayer, Bayer Aspirin, Excedrin, just did one on migraine, and you want, they wanted you to experience a migraine to, so that you would be empathetic, which, <laughs> which was just not fun. Okay. Um, and, um, so, so can you be made of migraine? Can you be empathetic? And I think the answer is truly you can. And anybody who's even had the cardboard experience of going through the Sudan um, on the Google Cardboard, it, it's, it's unforgettable and really moving. And it is a new media that's going to require a lot of different ways to tell story. Gender differences, David pointed this out in a study that girls did drop out. And it shows a curve of the quick ramp up to yeah, that, I mean, to be fair, this was a reasonably small study with Oculus Rift and kids 7 to 13. And the girls did, they lasted about 12 minutes, and then it was sort of, okay, done, done this. Boys tended to last about two to three minutes longer, so I'm not sure it's significant. Um, I think what, what I take from that more is that a 12 to 15 minute experience is where we're going to yeah. be for the time being. But yeah. I don't think you're going to be watching feature films in VR for, for quite a while. I kind of agree. And the other thing David pointed out that's um, pretty neat is that it's a much more focused meditative experience than an act of twitching. You're, you're really both. taking yeah, in and the we, world. We shouldn't ignore the, the focused yeah. and meditative side. Yeah. And most interesting, or has anybody played with the HoloLens, the Microsoft product? I just because that's a combined play. So they will take 
the virtual reality, but they will map your physical room. So now a dragon is coming out of your couch. And, um, and it makes it a very, very different kind of play. Um, the other thing that I think, so AI, we talked about AI, AR, VR, voice activation. Who has Alexa at home? Anybody? Life changer? Uh, Alexa, so afraid is she here? Because she'll start talking. Um, and, and Google Home now, which um, people are running side by sides. This is phenomenal. I mean, this is, this lets you run whatever you want to run with your voice. And, you know, whether it's Tell me the weather, how much is in my bank account, could you make a shopping list for me, can you play this music for me, um, you know, answering stupid questions. And you have it, if you've used Siri and Cortana and um, Google, you understand the voice, the power of voice. When you use Alexa and Google Home, first of all, age doesn't seem to matter, accents don't matter, I don't know how they manage this, the speakers sound pretty good. And um, it's, it's replaced everything that was in our kitchen as a one-stop cookbook shopping list. And um, so what does that mean for you? It's a storyteller, too. I mean, it's, it's another way to tell stories. And think about a shelf, or, uh, and there actually are some toys now. There's Tribby, which is a kid's version of Alexa, which has um, unique personas. So you can be Tommy or Jimmy or Sally. and um, Mom can leave you messages, just you, but it's all voice activated. So you're going to see those sorts of things. Um, we talked to, we looked at Duolingo this morning. I actually think it's not going to be long before simultaneous translation is going to happen on the, in real time. Um, it is. There's a product. <laughs> really? It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's so incredible. He, he's speaking French right now. Yeah. <laughs> you are blowing my mind, buddy. You and your, you and your other where the earpiece, and it's happening in real time. Wow. I think, I hate to say this, but I think Google just bought the start. What a surprise. Oh, look um, I, I have it written now. Yeah. And I, I do think voice is intergenerational, and it's one of those things, I've been talking to a few people here, because I work with older people in technology, too, and it's one of those transformative technologies that whether you're young or old, you will be able to use it um, with the same success and it's like your buddy. Um, wearables, you'll see all different sorts. You saw the moth band last year for kids, the noisy, you, you played, as you played, it made noises, swords swishing and uh, cooking and guitar playing. And, um, but we're seeing like these things get really more inventive. That pocketbook on the left actually shuts down. If you tell your app, after I spend $100, do not open this <laughs> pocketbook again. And, or, or if I have a credit card limit, and it's just a sensor, a lock, and, and you're at. The same thing with, um, we call it behavioral nudging. This one you wear on your lower back was done by a woman who believes that posture will get you that job. And so when you slouch, and it actually shows you the picture on your app of what you look like, and then you stand up again. And so wearables, we know. And my daughter works in a place where she's um, compensated uh, her insurance plan by walking. I mean, she does her 10,000 steps a day, she gets a break on insurance. Is that corporations invading your private space? Well, maybe, but it's working for her, both personally and monetarily. So those are the kinds of questions we're going to, I think, be asking. Um, I've seen some beautiful jewelry coming out at CES, and they're actually like the date jewelry. Like, it's a communications device, but one tap and your friends are there to bail you out of this thing. Um, <laughs> this bad date. And it's also a communicator and a calendar, but um, smart jewelry. Belts will, will be really in. Um, Let me ask a question of the kids. Anyone getting virtual allowance? In other words, like an iTunes gift card or anything like that for. You can, do you care? Oh, you're yeah. blind. You're an early adopter. So this came out of the UK. They're weird over there, right? Um, but, um, but there actually is a Cyber Moms for Bitcoin site. As I was researching this story, moms who are doing college savings in Bitcoins, who are mining Bitcoins, who, um, so I think um, on the, let me just leave it at this. I think kids will be very used to currencies. They play it in games all the time. It's gonna be very natural to make the switch from real <laughs> cash to virtual currencies and um, 
You know, I, I don't know. How many people have paid with their phone? Everybody, Apple mm -hmm. Pay or yeah. Samsung? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's that first, I don't know that if you remember the first time you did it, but it's kind of like weird. Um, and you kind of don't want to do it in public the first time. And so, <laughs> so you really have to, um, um, Get, get used to it. And this whole notion of micro sense, I know, is, you know, uh, I know so the Facebook community is hugely important in running a 99 cent ad or sending a gift to somebody. And um, digital currency, you should think about it in your games and in your life. Video trumping text. I mean, we just talked to these kids and they all told you what um, YouTube they saw last. What, I, what, um, what Wikipedia page did you? Did you use Wikipedia lately? Mm -hmm. No. Did you? Used two Wikipedia. Um, wow. Like, revelation? Uh, thank you, guys. Okay, your tip is out. No, seriously. Like, that's... You just put your point. That is a huge... I mean, that is so mind-blowing that YouTube is their encyclopedia. Um, so... And, and kid Google, right? And and you know, once you and, and what do they do? And um, they unbox things. I mean, you they went down the line and kind of verify that. And watch Minecraft videos, um, silly things about their day, morning routines. Love watching other people game, and the weird factoids about snot and anything else you can think of. Um, but love authenticity and the realness. I think somebody mentioned yesterday. Care less about the overall quality, um, and um, so YouTube kids, which not as many kids use as YouTube, um, was sort of YouTube's response to some people. This whole privacy thing. It's like we need a walled garden for kids, um, and um, but they know kids hate walled gardens, so it's sort of like that. That they that they did what they had to do. Um, and I think they did a pretty good job of it, but um, I don't think parents go crazy if their kid is using YouTube rather than YouTube Kids right now. Do, you, do any of you use YouTube Kids? <laughs> my, my, my cousin does. She's five, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. I, just, yeah, I, right. I don't. I haven't heard anything about YouTube Kids until now. How about Twitter or Facebook? Facebook has Twitter. Yeah, I've heard of this. Not Twitter. Tumblr, Instagram, Snapchat. Right. What does that mean when you communicate with people? Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, that's Facebook too. But yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, the Internet of Kids things. And so you've all heard about the Internet of Things, and kids will have their internet as well. This one happened to be that device I was talking about. It looks, it it acts like Alexa, but it has different uh, can let different people on the in the house. Uh, Tag in. It, right now, it, it is a big se security problem, the more of these things you have. But, Warren, you're building them out in media tech. You're building webcams that can control who goes into their kid's room, right? And robots that can monitor their your kid's room, or you can send the robot out in the kitchen. All of these things, uh, nobody thought about security in them at all. So, um, um, keep those passwords different and safe and all that for now. Um, um, uh, mobile apps, and I, I'm, again, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the adult world. So, in the brands, like in brands that spent a ton of money in mobile apps, Pepsi and Coke, uh, they're giving them up for weird sorts of loyalty arrangements. So, a lot of the big brands said, "Okay, that energy drink app didn't work for us, but this loyalty program of you drink ten of these and we'll give you a free pedicure works." Um, <laughs> And um, it works because they know you happen to like a, a free pedicure. And we know in the business community, again, more and more people are using fewer and fewer apps. So they've kind of settled on their five or six apps that they need to run their lives. And, um, and, and that's, that's it. And the apps most appreciated have some sort of proximity and context awareness. The social ones, I just, this is, I forget, the digi capital, but the growth this forecast in, in the social ones. Um, this is really hard. I'll make. It, I'll put a copy on the slide share. And in gaming. So, um, and this is just their forecast. But I think kids will experience the same thing. They're going to pick apps that they love, and um, 
they're going to settle on them and go for the brand that they love, and that will continue to play through. And I think Toka Boca was a, you know, the TV was a great example of that. And I just wondered, I felt like I had to talk about the sharing economy for a minute, because this is like major. Um, I have uh, kids, they're all in their 30s. Nobody owns a car. Only one owns a house, and not happily. Um, and um, so the question is, are they just going to think about this stuff differently? Because it's a shared economy. And how does that play into the apps they use? And more important for you guys, what is the kid's equivalent of Uber or Airbnb? Is it trading cards? Is it, you know, what, uh, is it best spots to play baseball? What can you do as app developers that disaggregate? You're just aggregating information and matching the people on the ends. And there's such a need for that. Uh, I saw one this morning in Hollywood. It's just, you can do your audition on this website, and then casters can just go do their first cast now. So I think anytime you see a problem now where there are two ends that need to come together, there's an app for that. And um, so I really, um, this disownership is, is, when I look at the data and people tell me, well, every millennial says, I don't want this, I don't want this, I say, well, one side of me says, well, that's because they're millennials. I didn't want a house and a car and kids and insurance policies either. They just sort of happened. But, um, <laughs> but I think there is some truth to um, that they may, in fact, uh, live differently or certainly live differently for longer. Um, so when I look at CEA, Go ahead. Before you go, you go back one? Yeah. So you, you had us wondering now, so what would you do with kids, right? But what is the disownership? So the two things that kids probably have the most interest in at least thinking about ownership is one, parents and siblings. Can I get rid of them? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the have some choice. And the second obvious one is school, right? Like the idea of actually having to have that fixed relationship with a building that's 60 years old and have no air conditioning. I'm just thinking, you yeah. know, I'm nine years old, I'm thinking maybe there's a better way to do this. Well, it's so funny. My, my son said to me the other day, I said, what, what do you want to do? And, and he said, I want to do a caregiving app where if you're not in the city to take care of your parents, you can hire somebody that is. You know, so match up a parent in another city, and you take care of their parents, and they'll take care of yours. So you don't have to keep running, because I keep making him see his grandmother. So you don't have to keep running and doing it. What's good about that? Each one doesn't know the other father's stories. I know. So they're, they're excited to listen. <laughs> but no, but it is. If you think about, you know, what's kids' worlds made of? You know, the trading cards, artwork, things you want to get rid of, things you have, things you want to loan, and all that's stopping us right now is um, privacy laws. At CES, the majority of our toys, and I know it's CES, so they're sort of um, selective and who goes there, but they're coding toys. So I got a call the other day from a an entrepreneur, like a, a VC that is now working with high school students and want to know if they could tap into our awards to, um, for their high school students. Would, would you agree that most of the time when we're talking about coding, we're not worrying about computers, we're talking about teaching kids logical thinking, iterative thinking? I would, I would agree. <coughs> and then I think as you get older, you have two paths. You either learn real coding yeah, or you learn how to talk to coders. <laughs> well, and if you've, learned, if you've learned iterative thinking, you know at least roughly how to talk to coders. Yeah. I've got a problem here, I think it. Yeah. And, and seriously, like, I am not a coder, but in my business, like, I remember when HTML happened, and I said, oh my God, I've got to put this magazine online, which is what I did then. And I was like, okay, I have to learn how to tell them, you know, and I had to learn a whole nother. I, I could have learned Spanish. I mean, it's really difficult. But anyhow, you look across all those technologies that we talked about, sharing economy, AI, VR, AR, I don't care what, they all require one thing that we haven't resolved yet, and that is personally identifiable information. And you have it as adults, and you have a pact, I'll give you something, you'll give me something. But with kids, it gets much, much murkier. Every store, every business knows the more you know about your customer, the better you can serve them. When you know who they are and what they want and where they get held up. So the question is, how do you treat kids in this pie world? Where I think right now we're losing something in these apps by not being able to target who they are, what they are, what their interests are. Could you quickly uh, change an app to be about horses 
rather than kids if that was, you know, expression. And, and um, right now, um, COPPA, which is the law that prevents us from uh, talking to kids under 13, is really causing people to leave the business. It's causing dollars to go away. Um, complying with it when you do decide to do it and getting parental consent is high. And um, so right now it's kind of a fiction. Um, and I'm sorry Facebook's in the room, but I said to them, you know, you guys don't let anybody under 13 on your site, right? And, and clearly they do, and clearly YouTube does. And so in the P, in the pie world, um, parental consent is a, is a fiction. And that's, um, I'm just gonna, um, I think the laws are pretty long in the tooth and they're hurting us as an economy. They're hurting us from being cooperative and, um, and, and competitive. And um, the kids are getting hurt too because if you know your kid has a problem with fractions, you can give them more of that or you know they won't move on until they do the next thing. And there are so many ways for knowing and not just talking to a weird aggregate out there. Um, that would be um, helpful to all of you. So that's the end of um, sort of like the world as I see it at CES. Um, <laughs> the end of the world as I know it. <laughs> <laughs>